Since we're speaking of false hope and they continue to run the false ad, um, there is no cross of Billy Graham. There's no cross of Jesus Christ. There is no Jesus. There is no Easter. There is no cross. All of those things are false. No one named Jesus lived in the first century of the common era. No one named Jesus even existed prior to the 17th century. That's when the name was first created. It bears absolutely no resemblance of any kind to the actual name of the individual it claims to be describing. There's no basis for Jesus anywhere in the Torah, Prophets, and Psalms, or in even in the Christian New Testament. It is a completely contrived name. If you do not know his name, you do not know him. If your religion has lied to you about the name of the individual they claim founded their religion, what else have they lied to you about? Easter is purely Babylonian. The name was, was conceived in Babylon. It is part of the sun god myths of the Babylonian pagan religion. It has no basis whatsoever in the Torah, Prophets, and Psalms. In fact, God speaks vociferously against celebrations like Christmas and Easter. He hates them. They're an abomination to him. And there is no cross. No, nothing even remotely like a cross. Not in the Torah, not in the Prophets, not in the Psalms, not even in the Christian New Testament. The concept that's in the Torah, Prophets, and Psalms presented throughout the uh, the Torah is Edom. Edom is, uh, is uh, an extremely important concept if you want to know who God is and what he has done for us. Edom is the upright pillar of the tabernacle. It's what secures the covering of the tabernacle and enables the tabernacle, which is another word for home, in this case Yahweh's home, which would be the, for the covenant family, to be enlarged. The upright one is a reference, the metaphor, one of the most common metaphors in the Torah, Prophets, and Psalms for Yahusha, the corporeal manifestation of Yahweh. He is the upright one, the one who stood up for us so that we could stand with him. Standing with him is an, an essential part of knowing who God is and what he's offering. He doesn't want us bowing down to him. He wants us standing with him. And so he took a stand on our behalf so that we could stand with him. That's what Edom conveys. That's what it means to be the upright one. It's all conveyed by Kum. It's in the campfire song that so many people miss. Kum by Yah. Stand in Yah. Stand with Yah. Kum, the Hebrew word for to take a stand. <laughs> now, as it relates to this uh, pagan notion of a cross, and you say, oh boy, if I read my, my King James Bible, I see cross all over the place. You can't tell me there's no cross in the Bible. Yeah, I can tell you that. Because it doesn't exist. The Greek word that uh, cross is, uh, has been convoluted uh, into replacing is duros. And it means upright pillar, upright pole. It is a translation of the Hebrew word Edom, almost identical to the Hebrew word Edom. In fact, Eros is even based on the Greek word uh, histemi. Uh, histemi is to take a stand so as to enable others to stand. It reflects the meaning behind Edom. And yet, Christians are desperate to have a cross. Why are they desperate to have a cross? Because Constantine, the, who along with Paul founded the Christian religion, established the Christian religion. Constantine saw the cross, which was the sign of his god, Mithras, emblazoned on his god, which was the sun, and heard a voice that happened to be Satan's voice saying, under this sign, conquer. And therein became the Christian cross. Sometime in the 5th century, Sturos upright pillar was replaced with the Latin crux or cross. That's how it all migrated. It, yet, since the term doesn't appear, since there is no such reference, 
if your religion has lied to you about the, its most dominant symbol, what else have they lied to you about? And why, after knowing now that they've lied to you, do you still trust them if you're still a Christian? Now, I said uh, it about an hour ago that uh, I wanted to change the topic that I had in Epiphany. And I've done the, um, something today that I uh, promised not to do. I, we spent the second hour uh, having a conversation with uh, Glenn about um, why it is appropriate, even if you're going to be amongst the few saying it, to turn to the Torah prophets and Psalms and convey what God has to say most logical, reasonable thing you can do. And that uh, was different than, than answering Adam Miller's questions, which from GCN I had promised to do, and we will do uh, perhaps in the second hour on Monday, since the second hour tomorrow will be uh, with IQ Hour Rasuli. But we did indirectly answer many of his questions as to how we came to this position, how we came to know what we know, how, why we're sharing this, where this information comes from. And so that was a productive thing to do. But about, um, and I'm glad we did it. Um, the conversation with Glenn was profound all the way through this process. But the epiphany, the, the change of subject that I suggested uh, over an hour ago, happened to be cross-related. And since this ad from Billy Graham has brought it up, I'm, I want to talk about it. A friend of mine sent me this morning um, an article. It happens to be on the Shroud of Turin. And what I have said is that, well, my knowledge of Yahweh is not based on it being real. And, and, uh, and I don't want to attest to the fact that it is real. There are so many um, affirmations in the Shroud of Turin that, that seem credible. I am, uh, my, personally, I have concluded after considering the evidence that it is real, that it was the, uh, the linen wrap that was uh, placed around the body of Yosha before that body ceased to exist. Now, at the time that, that I began to consider the evidence, I've considered the evidence after a long evaluation of uh, Psalm 22 and Psalm 88 which provide an eyewitness account to crucifixion that explain exactly how crucifixion works. And they go into enormous detail. And these were written about 1,000 BCE, um, 500 years before crucifixion was invented by the Assyrians and 1,000 years before it was perfected by the Romans. And it describes Roman crucifixion a thousand years before it occurred. And when I uh, came to realize all the various ways that from this eyewitness account on crucifixion, how crucifixion kills its victim, uh, and how what actually occurred on Pesach Passover in 33 CE, year 4000, yeah, uh, I was drawn to uh, the, uh, the shroud because it's in the image on that cloth uh, shows exactly what one would expect. Uh, and scientifically, medically accurate, uh, here in the case of that uh, particular artifact, uh, 1,500 years before we actually understood the process of crucifixion. One thing about crucifixion, it's, it's interesting that the way that it works is that with a with a person hanging by their arms, with their arms above their head, not outstretched as the Christian uh, view of it uh, is portrayed, but with their arms upstretched ab above their head, um, that the, the diaphragm doesn't work properly. And the way the chest muscles are stretched, it becomes impossible to breathe in. And when that happens, when you can't take a deep breath, fluids begin to fill in your lungs. The crucifixion victim feels this enormous thirst because the fluids in their body are all pooling in their lungs. They're unbelievably thirsty, and yet they're drowning in their own fluids. And, it, and then the, the toxic waste in the, in the blood can't be, and in the lungs, can't be expelled. And so 
your heart becomes extremely weak. And while your bones aren't broken, they all come out of their socket. Your ligaments are stretched. Your all of the sockets and the joints of the you know the elbows and the wrists and the shoulders all become disjointed. And the only way that a victim in crucifixion can survive more than an hour or so is if they can push up on their feet. And why the while the the depictions we have of crucifixion show, um, you know, two feet side by side, uh, uh, nailed uh, directly through the, uh, the the bones that ultimately become our toes. That's not how it was done. The, the two legs were put um, side by side, if you uh, will, twisted, and then one nail was driven through the uh, the heel, uh, just behind the the ankle and the heel, and for. A short period of time, at excruciating agony, you could push up on that nail with excruciating agony. And by pushing up on the nail, you would uh, stop this the stretching mechanism of, of hanging from your wrist. And, and it, the nails weren't driven in the hand. If you drove a nail in the hand, uh, it would just pull right through and then, you know, it would do no good at all. The, the nail was actually driven through the, uh, the wrist, just below the, uh, where the arm and the wrist uh, intersect. And there's a nerve there that's excruciating again when uh, it is pierced. And that's the nerve that they... Uh, they uh, nail through. Uh, and the that the process then of pushing up on the heels is the only thing that enables you to breathe. And you can only do it so long because you become so weak with the toxics building up in your in your uh, in your system and your lungs fill with fluids and uh, this is how they die. And so I looked at the Shroud of Turin and and, and depict all of this. All of it's depicted. Right there in the image. And then something I didn't even know at the time is that Yosha's physical body had to be destroyed that night. It had to be incinerated. And that's exactly how the image appears on the shroud. Energy incinerating the body, leaving this photo negative on the, limit, uh, on the piece of linen. And so it looked to me as real. Now we'll get to the point after the commercial break. Welcome back to Shattering Mist. We're talking about the uh, Christian cross and how that image, which is a uh, a vertical pole with a cross beam that is mounted uh, two thirds to three quarters the way up, so that the vertical pole exists uh, below and above the cross beam. So it's in the shape of a lowercase t versus a capital T is wrong. You see, it's a, it was apparent for a lot of reasons. Um, most interesting uh, from my perspective was this correlation between edone and then the Greek uh, term steros and its basis systemic. Uh, that the implement of, uh, of physical death for the body of Yosha was an upright pole. And uh, the Christian cross I knew from research was a pagan uh, implement. It, it really came uh, uh, as initially into the religious nomenclature through Tammuz. The first letter of Tammuz's name was, uh, was used to convey this concept of a pagan cross. So uh, I then began to do a little research and and found out that the uh, that wood had become very scarce, particularly uh, long, sturdy beams in uh, Israel. Uh, they had olives, and olive was about the only tree of consequence. Uh, they had over harvested the cedars of Lebanon, and so uh, about a thousand years prior, and so the only wood that was available of any consequence was uh, was all of it and the main trunk of an olive isn't very tall and it's extraordinarily rare to take an olive and to take it out of production and to use it for this upright pillar 
And I recognize that it made no sense to constantly replace the upright pillar, nor did it make any sense to try to nail the cross beam into that pillar, A, with the enormous value of nails made out of, uh, out of iron and the value of iron at the time, uh, but also, once you've nailed the that cross beam into the that uh, the upright, and you've done it a number of times, uh, you're going to destroy both. They're not reusable, and reusing it was essential. And so, I began to to study it, and what I found is that that in the limestone of of uh, Jerusalem, particularly of Mount uh, Moriah. That they, uh, the Romans would dig a, uh, would chisel out a receptacle. Uh, you know, let's just say on average uh, about uh, seven inches, eight inches by eight inches, a square receptacle. And they would uh, chisel that down into the the limestone, oh, about uh, eight inches. So imagine a a square hole cut into the ground chiseled into the limestone that is about 8 inches by 8 inches by 8 inches. And then they would take a uh, an upright pillar of wood, an edon in Hebrew, a steros in Greek, and they would set that into that uh, receptacle where it would remain. And it would be, on average, maybe about uh, uh, 7 to 8 feet tall above the ground. And it would stay there. This idea that you pick up a uh, uh, the entire cross and carry it is nonsense. That's not what happened. That beam, the upright beam, stayed in place right there. And then what they would do is that they would take the the uh, horizontal beam that the individual's um, um, wrists would be affixed to initially roped and then later nailed. And they would, uh, um, rather than uh, it remaining in place, it wouldn't be almost impossible to, uh, and the whole work of getting somebody, you know, you, the pictures that they have in movies of you being nailed to the, uh, the cross that you've carried uh, while you're laying flat on your back, and then uh, the person and the cross being lifted, and, uh, and then the jolt to the body. That, Nonsense, not how it worked. The, the, it was a much shorter uh, cross member than is depicted in, um, in the Christian myth and in the Christian uh, cross. About uh, maybe a third is long. And it was not affixed to, uh, to uh, the pole two-thirds or three-quarters of the way up. I mean, it's, it's so logical what the Romans did. They simply cut out a, uh, a, uh, a notch on the cross member, and they simply had a, uh, a, uh, a raised portion on the top of the pole, and they lifted the, that short beam and set it on top. Not going anywhere. Doesn't need to be nailed. Can always be reused. Putting it all together, there's another affirmation, and that's why I mentioned the Shroud of Turin. This article was sent to uh, to me today that that uh, confirms that the victim who is uh, displayed in the uh, Shroud of Turin, that uh, when they were crucified, their arms weren't outstretched, as you will find them on the pagan Christian cross. Nope, they were directly over the victim's head. Exactly what I had concluded. Now, those two things. One is, uh, since if this was a fraud, there would have been no reason for the fraudulent artist to have depicted the crucifixion victim uh, with uh, arms directly over their head because by that time, if this is a medieval forgery, there were a few billion, that might be a slight extrapolation or exaggeration, 
uh, crucifixion uh, crucifixes uh, all over um, Roman Catholic cathedrals, and uh, this depiction has the person, the nail driven through the wrist, not through the hands, as they are in the Catholic Church crucifixion, has the nail driven through the, the back of the heel, not through the front of the uh, foot, as is in the, uh, the Christian uh, depiction. And uh, it shows a person that uh, endured Roman crucifixion exactly as the Romans did it. But on a, an implement that isn't even remotely akin to the pagan Christian cross. If Christianity has lied to you about this, what else have they lied to you about? And speaking of the cross of Billy Graham and its connection with Easter, and then they're talking about in the power of the resurrection, according to Yahweh, there was no resurrection. No bodily resurrection. It would be counterproductive. It would be completely counter to his Torah instructions. As a matter of fact, if there had been a bodily resurrection, then Yahweh or Yosha, whoever was responsible for it, would be a liar, undependable. Um, no longer a valid sacrificial lamb. Read what Yahweh wrote in his Torah about Passover. Read about what happens to the the remaining parts of the body of that lamb after the lamb has served its purpose. It's incinerated, just as the shroud of Turin depicts. No longer exists, and it's only the physical body that succumbs. The soul of that lamb was not killed, just as the soul of God was not killed. It had work to do. Matzah. Yahushua's soul, we're told in the 22nd Psalm and the 88th Psalm, and Yahshua 53, that the soul of Yahuwah had work to do. Went into Sheol on our behalf, on Matzah, to remove the fungus of sin from our souls making us perfect in God's eyes, so that we could be born anew from above, in spirit, on Bakudim, which means firstborn children, just as he was with soul and spirit reunited, the body long gone. That's why no one recognized him. If your religion has lied to you about Easter, about Jesus, about the cross, about bodily resurrection, how many more lies... Do you need to hear before you're going to say, they're not trustworthy, they're not worthy of my soul, and you're going to walk away from them? Because until you walk away from them, you have no chance of developing a relationship with Yahweh or being saved by him. It is the prerequisite of the covenant. So, uh, Glenn, I know you're still uh, listening. I can hear some noise in the background. Um, it was, uh, it was the story of the uh, cross and how it, um, it too, was false that uh, I wanted to share and, and how um, something is, as uh, initially unbelievable as the Shroud of Turin correctly depicts what actually occurred. Whether it's true or not, it, uh, it depicts what the way that... Crucifixion took place, emphasizing the upright nature of the pole, upon which the upright right. hung, so we could stand upright with him. Right, and that's uh, and you know, and I'm thinking. I mean, I, I know a lot of Christians who are uh, receptive to such like historical corrections. Many many people, you know, um, are now aware of you know the fact that. Um, you know, nails didn't go through the feet. They went, you know, by, well, I'm, I'm not even sure about the, uh, like, as you're talking about, the, in the heel. Many people aren't aware of that, but they're certainly aware that the nails didn't go through the hands, that they went down below the joint at the wrist, mm-hmm. <laughs> and stuff like that. So I don't, I don't um, so like I said, uh, I think, uh, you know, part of the reason I'm not quite as anxious for you to be quite so vehement against Christians per se is because, you know, I think many people, well, as you sort of said yesterday about people from, 
uh, you know, like, you know, Missouri or the Ozarks, you know, the mm-hmm. people who are away from urban areas are receptive, you know, ind- independently thinking individuals, um, mm-hmm. you know, receptive to truth. And yes. it's the same thing. I mean, I found, I find, you know, I think many Christians would be receptive to the uh, historical corrections you just articulated. Yeah, you know of course, I mean? but of course the historical correction has to go beyond the image of the Christian cross. It has to go beyond the uh, the uh, that to uh, to obliterate connections with Easter and to uh, and to obliterate corrections with a with a bodily resurrection. So you've got so many things that they that and if you're willing to take the first step. And, and by the way, I I, I begin the show by saying that the fastest growing and and uh, largest segment of our society today are those who've come to realize that there are problems with such things, including their religion. And so I do think there are enormous numbers of people who would still consider themselves Christian who are no longer going to church, who have realized that there's something dreadfully wrong with what is being preached in their churches and have begun to question it. And that's the first step. That's an important first step. And those are the folks we're trying to reach. And I think there's actually a disproportionate number of of responsible thinking people um, in the heartland of America than there uh, there are at the fringes. So uh, I'm I'm extraordinarily hopeful. And as it relates to people being willing to reject the lies and embrace the truth, which is why I constantly say, how many times does that religion have to lie to you? Before you finally say, you know, it's not worthy of my soul. It's not trustworthy. Well, well, given that, uh, given that it's not possible, it, well, it's not really, well, it may not be possible. It's not, it's not desirable for one to uh, to wipe the slate of one's mind clean, so it's become sort of uh, some Cartesian uh, tabula mm-hmm. rasa <laughs> and start yes. over. It, it, it's, 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 most people are going to piece through and correct right. their misnotions. Right. Notion. Correct. And, and in Christianity, you know, the discipline of Christology, you know, that looks at all these things, who was the Christ, well, you know, what was the sequence of events. So, I mean, okay, uh, that's fine, you know. Um, so, like, uh, what you were articulating would, would, you know, would be the sequence of events in your uh, Masiology, I guess, is, is yeah. the necessary Correct. translation. And, and, and that which would be systematized because oh, everybody's going to ask the same questions. It's like, okay, now we understand what you're saying about how Christ changed, you know, from the time of, you know, it, you know from, from the time that, that he was, you know, put upon the death bowl, you know, mm-hmm. and all that sort of thing. And people might be willing, you know, or right. hesitant to modify their terminology. But, but you know, the questions all have to be answered one by one, and it's like, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, that makes yeah. sense. Right. And you end up displacing the misnotions with the new corrected notion. I've just put uh, Glenn on hold here. Everything he said is is absolutely accurate. Uh, but uh, Glenn, we we really do need to buy you a new telephone. Um, the uh, the voice quality is is just got to be so bad that I couldn't uh, I couldn't uh, bear it on behalf of our listeners. Uh, but keep in mind everything that he just said is true. And it's that process that is extremely important. I mean, it's it's not just what Glenn said is true. It's how important what he said is to all of us to appreciate. None of us go through an immediate cleansing uh, of our slate. We're not capable of it. I didn't go from from evangelical Christian, from ordained ruling elder in, in the Presbyterian Church, perhaps if maybe even the youngest el- ever, to leading Bible studies and, and all of that sort of thing. To uh, becoming an agnostic, and then to becoming part of Yahweh's family, and rejecting Christianity in a day. It was a long journey. A very long journey. And there's aspects of the Christian myths that um, I'm sure still cling to me. Uh, I find myself... Rejecting them one after another. It's uh, the very process that Glenn says that he's on is the process that I have been on and continue to be on. And 
The next thing that, that Glenn said is, is equally important. It's not just that we're going on a voyage of discovery, and as we learn new things, we are erasing from our memory, from our acceptance, those things which are found to be untrue, and replacing them with that which is, is true. There's something about this journey that is extraordinary, and that is that all of the little details... And with this upright pillar, and you might say, you know, big, geez, the big, di what's the big difference between an upright pillar that's that's in the foundation of the bedrock there of Mount Moriah that just has a uh, a small horizontal piece set right on the top of versus the Christian cross? Boy, those details just seem so small, but they're not. Each of them has great merit. And when you understand why each of them is, is so important, and how each time you understand why it is that way, you say, oh, yeah, wow, that makes sense. Okay, oh, well, that's consistent. Oh, that's another insight. Yes, that, that piece fits, too. And as you watch each of these details, each of these pieces make sense and fit and collectively interconnect as the most beautiful picture is formed before your eyes vivid detailed precise consistent from every viewpoint and every angle after a while you just begin to trust the author that presented this picture final segment of Shattering Mist for today. The message here is that I am surprised. Uh, I am stunned, as a matter of fact, that this appears to be the only radio program and perhaps even the only series of books between yadayah.com and introtogod.org, even questioningpaul.com, that are willing to share with you what Yahweh, which is God's one and only name, had to say about himself. What he actually conveyed to us. To demonstrate how different what God revealed is, God's testimony is, from the religious myths that claim to be based upon his inspiration. You know, it's, it is surprising. And the reason it's surprising is that all I had to do is go to the most obvious place, to the beginning, to Barashith, which is Genesis, to Shemoth, which is uh, Exodus, to Kara, which is Leviticus, and through the Torah, which means teaching just to go to those books and look at the words. I didn't have to learn to speak Hebrew. In fact, speaking Hebrew would probably be a liability. What I had to do was to be willing to invest the time to buy interlinears, to buy scholarly tomes on the history of the Dead Sea Scrolls and the text of the Dead Sea Scrolls so I could have access to the earliest manuscripts and then buy a series of lexicons so that uh, rather than relying on one academic source, I could rely on 5, 10, 15, or more on only the meaning of the words, but the roots of the words. And that so I could do a little due diligence and say, all right, now I'm looking at the actual letters. How were these letters originally written? And to study the, the history of the Hebrew alphabet and to realize that there's a lexicon just in the shape of the letters. A lexicon meaning a definition of what the words mean when they're comprised of certain letters because the letters were all pictures. And then to use those things. You know, initially I did it all through uh, paper. I, I've got interlinear after interlinear. I've got 20 books on the Dead Sea Scrolls. I've got 20 Hebrew or English 
<laughs> lexicons and, and dictionaries. And then I bought uh, some concordances, which which um, share with you where where else a word is used. So if you're trying to define a word, you could look up the first time that word's used. You could look up subsequent times that word's used, and and to make sure that your definition is consistent, and to see how the context uh, defines the word. And so you buy these tools. And then you uh, take a little time and say, you know, well, I'm going to study uh, Hebrew grammar. I want to make sure that I'm conveying this correctly. And you learn, well, well in Hebrew, they've got stems. Well, stem, what's a stem? Well, it's, it denotes a relationship between the subject and the object of the sentence through the action of the verb. And it talks about that relationship. And, and then uh, in Hebrew, there are no tenses in the sense of time. And no Hebrew verb is stuck in time like English verbs are. There's no past, present, or future tense. But instead, a perfect and imperfect, which let us know if an action is complete or if it is ongoing. And then there are moods. With almost all the moods conveying volition, free will, choice. And so you put all that together and then you go word for word. What was said? Amplify it. Look at it under a, a microscope, if you will. And try to learn every nuance of every word so that you might understand what is being said. And just then go through the Torah as Yahweh revealed it. And then there's this issue of God's name. Come to find out every place you read Lord in your English Bible 7,000 times in the Torah, Prophets, and Psalms. Or you read, Lord, that's not what's there. Come to find out, Yahweh told us in Yermiah, Jeremiah, that the replacement of his name with the satanic title, Lord, is the single most devastating thing, destructive thing humankind has ever done. And you find 7,000 times Yahweh wrote his name. Yod, hey, wah, hey. It's just do a... A bit of research and you find that those four letters, actually three letters, one's repeated, represents three of the five vowels in the Hebrew language. And you examine the other words that were, are so common in Hebrew, like Torah, and it becomes obvious how to pronounce his name. It's Yahweh. None of this is difficult. It just takes time and an open mind. We'll be back tomorrow.